There is a particular view of history that is repeated again and again in the world of dog worship. This history tells us that humans and dogs have had a very close relationship with each other for thousands of years. This relationship works to the advantage of both species, but is of more benefit to the human side of the partnership. Dogs and humans are two species that have lived in perfect harmony, supporting and helping each other. Dictionary.com defines the word symbiotic in the following way living in symbiosis, or having an interdependent relationship. Many people feel the relationship between humans and dogs is symbiotic. There seems to be general agreement among dog lovers that dogs and humans have existed in a symbiotic relationship for thousands of years, supporting each other, helping each other out, and being friends with one another. This is how Wikipedia introduces the subject of the human-canine bond. Human-canine bonding is the relationship between dogs and humans. This bond can be traced back at least 15,000 years ago to the Bon Oberkastle dog that was found buried with two humans. For centuries, dogs have been labeled as man's best friend, offering companionship and loyalty to their human counterparts. This is evident in most homes where dogs are domesticated. Children and adults have cordial relationships with all kinds of dogs. This is followed by historical examples to illustrate this bond. This sounds absolutely wonderful. It's like a fairy tale. We are all familiar with these ideas about dogs. We have read and heard the claims that dogs have a very special bond with humans and that this bond stretches back into the mists of time. Dog worshippers claim that there is a historical provenance to these ideas. This historical provenance is usually as vague and ill-defined as the historical provenance of pit bulls being referred to as nanny dogs. In my video, Rough and Puff, I traced the first appearance of the term nanny dog applied to pit bulls. That was in 1987 in the Toronto Star. Dog worshippers will continue to write about the term nanny dog being common in the 19th century. So we have to be careful about vague historical dates. The Wikipedia article quoted earlier states that for centuries, dogs have been labeled as man's best friend. The first obvious question that has to be asked is how many centuries? In other words, when did people start calling dogs man's best friend? Stop! 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 No! 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 I can answer that for you, and when I do, you will realize why dog worshippers are notoriously vague on the subject. The first record of the phrase in print was in the New York Literary Journal in 1821. Some dog idolatry websites claim that the phrase was first used by King Frederick of Prussia in 1789. An anonymously attributed quote from a long-dead aristocrat is hardly what you would call common usage. It's what you would call clutching at straws. King Frederick of Prussia may have believed that his dog was his best friend, but that's not the same as suggesting that it was a commonly held belief at the time. This fact is useless as evidence that dogs have been generally considered as best friends. He may have been the only person in Prussia who believed this. Roxy. Go over to Grace. Here, Pina. Come here. Where's the puff? Where's the 
and puff. The 19th century princess Alexandra Amelie of Bavaria believed that she had swallowed a glass piano. But I have no reason to believe that this was a common belief at the time. If it was a widely held belief, it seems to have died out over time. When dog worshippers use history to support their beliefs, they commonly select a single case to represent evidence of a widely held belief. This is deceptive. It's the old trick of arguing from the specific to the general. You will be familiar with the type of comment, my dog has never bitten anyone, therefore dogs don't bite unless provoked. Using King Frederick as an example of the human species having dogs as best friends can be summarized as King Frederick loved his dog, therefore everyone loved dogs. It is nonsensical. The popularity of the phrase man's best friend comes from a court case in 1870. Leonidas Hornsby shot his neighbor's dog dead and the dog owner, Charles Burden, sued him for $100. Burden's attorney gave an impassioned and melodramatic closing speech, which was essentially a sentimental eulogy for the dead dog. The case and the speech were widely reported, and this is what popularized the phrase man's best friend. The popularity of the phrase man's best friend originates from an attorney's attempt at inflating the worth of a dead dog to gain a $100 settlement. 1870 is not centuries ago. It is a specific point in time, but making vague claims about history gives more authority to made-up stories. In the rational world, the word century is defined as a period of 100 years. Dog worshippers don't seem to know this, so to them, a century is a vague, flexible period of time. The use of the plural centuries is no more precise. She needs the shots after being attacked and bitten by a dog Tuesday. Marge says she was waiting here in front of her home on Girard Avenue when two dogs she didn't recognize came up from behind. One dog grabbed her leg and bit her at least five times. On the attack. It's a vicious animal. Dogs protecting the elderly female. When dogs are described as having been man's best friend for centuries, it could mean anything. Some use the word millennia as in dogs and humans have been close and faithful companions for millennia. That has as much meaning to them and us as their use of the word centuries. Before I move on, I want to pose a question about the phrase man's best friend. The question is, what does it mean? It is a meaningless phrase. Apart from a tiny percentage of dogs that are trained for specific tasks, dogs don't do anything that could be interpreted as helpful useful, or friendly. Their behavior is intensely selfish and greedy. Hello. Hello. Trained dogs have to be repeatedly or constantly trained and brought under control in order to behave in any kind of acceptable manner. This innocent woman was attacked by a police dog outside her own home. Please. Yep. Help me. Dogs do not behave like any friend I have ever experienced or would want to experience came across our radar today and it happened in the Bronx uh, a little girl attacked by a dog normally that is something that happens and we do hear about a lot of dog attacks but look on your screen as a grandmother walks with her 
little grandchild, that dog came flying across the street and latched onto that little girl and did not let go. One bystander getting out of his car to help, other bystanders coming to help, trying to pry that dog off of that girl. The characteristics you would normally expect from a friend are totally missing in a dog. There is no empathy or understanding of your situation. There is no generosity or support. In short, a dog is no friend at all. There is historical and archaeological evidence that humans and dogs have lived in close proximity to each other for a long time. The Bonn Obercastle site mentioned in the Wikipedia reference dates back 14,000 years. This lengthy relationship is just as likely to have been mutual exploitation or mutual competition as mutual cooperation. Ralph Hughes raised these three pit bulls since they were puppies. I ain't never had no more problem with them. I mean, I, I, I love my babies. But... That all changed Monday morning when all three dogs attacked an elderly woman. I can't believe it. Because they're so good with people, you know. You think you know them, but you don't, you know. Fernando County Sheriff's Office says the victim was walking off Spring Lake Highway, a route she usually walks, when three pit bulls attacked her. Hughes tells me he got a call right after the incident. They chewed it through the door. I, I left them last night and I, and I come back this morning and they called me. The victim was airlifted to the hospital. The only explanation that dog worshippers want to explore is one of a long lasting friendship and symbiosis between humans and canines. Domestication of sheep goes back over 7,000 years, but we don't consider them to be our friends. The same applies to the 10,000 year domestication of cattle. I can imagine a dog worshiper listening to this and thinking that dogs are special. They are different to other animals. There is a special bond with humans that other animals don't have. If this is the case, then there should be plenty of evidence for it in historical documents, biographical writing, memoirs, literature, and fiction. If, as they claim, there is a long-established, widely held, and agreed-upon fact that dogs are our friends, then it should be bursting out of the written historical record. But it is not. They have to ferret out obscure and isolated cases in which people praise dogs or claim that dogs help people out. They have to ignore contradictory historical accounts of hatred or fear of dogs. For example, my piece entitled Man's Worst Fiend annoyed some dog lovers who wanted to claim that well-documented examples of dogs used to intimidate, control, and kill was unproven rumor. William Shakespeare had his finger on the pulse of his audience. He knew what his audiences wanted, and he knew what his patrons liked and wanted. If the love of dogs had been a commonly held belief system at the time, you would expect his plays to feature dogs as characters or plot devices, or that dogs would be used as metaphors for noble characteristics. Apparently, there are only two Shakespeare plays where a dog appears on stage. And in neither of these instances are dogs portrayed in a favorable light. A dog called Crab makes two appearances in The Two Gentlemen of Verona. It is compared to a pebble stone because it is so lazy. In Shakespeare's world, being committed to a dog makes you a fool. Shakespeare uses the word dog 151 times in his plays, and usually to describe aggression, amorality, and callousness. Villains are insulted by calling them dogs. <laughs> Thank you.
I have already discussed the phrase dogs of war in an earlier video. Shakespeare could be an exception, but it is more likely that he is a person of his age and is in step with the common feeling about dogs. His contemporaries were not known for praising dogs either. The important point to be made here is that the idea of dogs being wonderful creatures and friends of humans reflects a totally modern frame of mind and is not supported by history in the way that dog worshippers claim. Another way that we can get a glimpse into historical beliefs about dogs is the language that we use. If there has been an unbroken history of friendship with dogs, then the language should reflect this. Dog-related phrases should signify positive attributes and should be related to compliments. We use animal phrases such as as quiet as a mouse, as wise as an owl, as cunning as a fox. Someone who has taken care of their appearance can be described as a peacock. A greedy person is a pig. Someone easily led is a sheep, and so on. What does the English language say about dogs? The evidence of our language seems to indicate that we did not hold dogs in high regard in the past. Using the word dog to describe someone is always negative. It can suggest that they are treacherous, unscrupulous, and lacking in morals. To call someone a dog can also infer that they are ugly. The song Who Let the Dogs Out by the Baha Men is an example. The author claims that in the song it is men who are being described as dogs and mongrels. The word dog meaning ugly or lacking in charm is usually applied to female humans. Use the word dog as a verb, and it means to harass or annoy, as does the verb to hound. When something worries or haunts you for a while, you may say, this problem has been dogging me for some time. Something of poor quality can be described as a dog, as in, that TV show was a real dog I switched over before the end. To be tricked, sold something falsely, or be stuck with poor quality goods is to be sold a pup. The word bitch, originally meaning a female dog, is applied almost exclusively to human females and suggests spitefulness, dishonesty, and aggression. When applied to human males, it suggests cowardice and a lack of masculinity. Almost every reference to the word dog in well-known sayings is insulting or negative, such as a dog's dinner or a dog's breakfast, dog bite dog, a dog's life, black dog meaning depression. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, dog tired, and so on. I have come across a similar pattern in other languages that I speak, such as French and Dutch. Dutch is full of expressions that include the word dog, and almost all of them are very negative. For example, de hond in de pot vinden. Uh, the Dutch word for dog is hond. And literally translated, this expression means to find the dog in the pot. It means to find nothing left to eat. Everything's gone. This reflects the greedy nature of dogs. Wie met honden omgaat, krijgt vloeien. Literally translated means those who hang out with dogs get fleas. It means if you hang out with bad people, you will acquire bad habits. In French, similar sentiments are expressed. To be in a dog's mood means to be in a bad mood. Name of a dog is an expression of distaste. In Quebec, where I come from, there are insults and a number of expressions that include the word dog uh, or chien, which is a male dog, or chien, female dog, and none of them are positive. If we have a hangover or take another alcoholic drink, it is referred to as the hair of the dog. This stems back to fear of rabies. 
A medieval treatment for rabies was to eat a hair from the dog that bit you. Any positive phrases are modern. There is no unbroken history of dog admiration. Some offensive words for dogs have disappeared and been replaced with modern sentimental equivalents. From cur to doggo, from tyke to pupper, from mongrel to mixed breed or cockapoo. I will stop there with examples. There are enough to illustrate that the use of false history is deceptive. People who practice deception and manipulation try to involve you in a process called gaslighting. Named after a 1944 film, it is a process by which the manipulator tries to persuade the victim that they are the one in the wrong. In extreme cases, the victim may end up doubting their own sanity. This manipulation of history in respect to dogs is a form of gaslighting. If you disagree with the idea that dogs are man's best friend, you have the weight of history against you. You are not only disagreeing with the individual dog worshipper, you are also going against the views of countless millions of anonymous people in history. When King Frederick of Prussia gets thrown into the mix, you are really out on a limb with your crazy ideas. Look at my video on logical fallacies and you will recognize that the use of history to suggest centuries of tradition or social conformity is an appeal to numbers, similar to the idea that because most people believe it, you should too. The mention of historical figures like King Frederick is an appeal to authority. This is similar to the idea that Patrick Stewart loves pit bulls, so you are wrong to fear them. Those of us who have stood up to dog worshippers will be accustomed to being told that we are crazy or mad. This is gaslighting, pure and simple. Once we recognize the gaslighting for what it is, then we may have a chance of making the future dog free. Right at me. You're the one growling. See, you're the one growling at me. Damn, you turned into a whole nother beast. I don't even know who you are right now. <laughs> who do you think you are? You want my, hold on. You want my food. You want my food, but yet you're gonna growl at me? Cause they're so good with people, you know? You think you know them, but you don't, you know?